Pastor Sam, I don't know anything. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome you. Good morning. Uh, to greet. Many of you have been here last year or the last year's plural. Yeah, some good friends here. Um, before we start, I need to remind you that we take uh, a group picture today after the last session, after Stephanie's session. So we meet outside as usual and take a group picture. The next thing is we have the reception, the Uso reception and wine reception at 7 o'clock scheduled, but now we do it at 6 o'clock after the last session. Because otherwise, if you are away for one hour, right, not many of you will show up at the reception. So after last session, we go and have Uso together, and then everybody does what he wants to do. And the last thing, <coughs> I want to present the poster. Uh, please give the posters to Themis, the nice person who is outside to give you your badge, until Wednesday noon. So that Themis can take care and uh, put them down where the uh, poster session will take place. So, any other organizational questions? No. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we start today with a session on quantum computing. So, I gave a talk last year on quantum computing together with a colleague from China, proving that quantum computing gets real. In the meantime, uh, we even got a project in the area of quantum computing. Um, and I, together with Stephanie, Stephanie Graz, she has a the third talk today. She's a quantum physicist and she will uh, explain stuff that I can't explain. So I try to focus on algorithm and mathematics. You will see a lot of formulas. Don't be shocked because the formulas, is, uh, they are important, but uh, to understand what quantum computing is all about, you don't need to understand the formulas first place. Yeah? So, I structure the uh, talk as follows. I give you three lines of quantum physics. Then I explain qubit, quantum register, how to work with the quantum register, why is quantum computer fantastic, because it speed ups compared to classical algorithms. Uh, I briefly mentioned search again. I did it last year, but I would focus on the special kind of complexity class, which is very important for uh, quantum computing. How to crack keys based on quantum computing, but the good news is you can even do encryption better. Then a little bit of error correction and miss, and then I conclude. Stephanie yesterday saw the slides and said, do you manage 80 slides? I said, yes, 100 would be okay. So mm. I have time today. Yeah? So let's focus on basic quantum physics. This is a very important formula that most of you have seen in school, I hope. If you had physics at school, you saw that. But it's the Heisenberg uncertain principle. What you see here is you have basically um, the place where a moving particle is and the momentum, basically the velocity of the part. <coughs> you see if you want to measure very precise the location and the velocity of the particle, you will fail. Because precision is measured by this delta x. Delta x is the small range where the particle is that you expect, and delta p is the small range of velocity. And the small ranges, if you multiply them, are always positive. They're greater than the positive number. That means you, can't, you can never achieve the delta x is zero and or uh, delta p is zero. That means there is an uncertainty where a particle has a particular velocity. Right? This has the impact and can be best uh, depicted by, the, you, saw, you saw that last year too, by Schrodinger's cat. Right? This is a very nice figure. What you see here is, is your very, very large cat and the cat, you put it into a box, and here's a very cool apparatus. Right? What you have here is you have radioactive matter, and it decays completely stochastically, random. And if it decays, there's a detector who detects it, and then it falls down, the hammer falls on the glass, and there's a very cool poison in there, and immediately the cat will be dead. So because the radio of matter is the radioactive, the radioactive matter is uh, decaying randomly, if you close the box, you don't know whether the cat is dead or alive. Because as soon as you close the box, uh, the decay may happen, the cat is dead, and, but it may happen never or in many, many years. That means if after one hour you open the box, right, the cat may be still alive. So what is the status of the cat when the box is closed and you are standing outside? It's a zombie state. Right? The cat is both dead and alive from the outside because you don't know. And this is what we call superposition, right? Superposition. 
It's a superposition of both states being dead and alive. And only if you open the box, when you measure, then you see is the cat dead or is the cat alive. Then you measure what the actual state basically is. This is superposition. This is what we will use in quantum computers. Right? And then here's the uh, Dilbert version. How's your quantum computer pro prototype coming on? Uh, coming along? Great! And then the manager says the, pro and the project exists in the stimulants, some in the state of being both totally successful and not even started. And the manager asks, can I observe it? That's a tricky question. <laughs> but this is Dilbert's version of showing us cat. Right? So what the hell is then a qubit? What are we using there? So qubits, here are the classical states, 0, uh, 1, that we are usually using, right, that we know in classical computer science. But a qubit is like showing us cat both true and false, 0 and 1. It's in a superposition of being true and false. And what we see here, the factors, alpha and beta, the coefficient, they basically determine the probability of being 1 or 0. That means the these are even complex numbers, complicated, complex numbers. So you can take the modulus and <coughs> square it, and the sum of the squares of the moduli of the coefficient is equal to 1. That means the probability, if you measure it, you measure 0 or 1 is 1. So you measure exactly one thing. This is why the sum is 1. And how can you depict it in the first iteration? You have here the unit circle. Here you have 0, here you have 1. And it's a vector on the unit circle. This is the state of a qubit. Right? This is how we typically do it. And this strange notation, I'm not like deep into it. This with this bracket, this is rectangle with this bracket. This is a unit vector 1, 0. This is a vector 0, 1. Right? This is how you can use it if you do some computations. <coughs> so what I said is that this is on the unit circle, but I was cheating because alpha and beta are complex numbers, so it's a bit more complicated. It's a bit more complicated as follows. So we need the following first. If you have um, a, a state with complex numbers, what you can do is you can rewrite it as follows. You can use spherical coordinates. Spherical coordinates on the sphere is you find an angle theta and you find an angle rho so that the state, that the, that the vector of the unit sphere um, obeys this equation. And what that basically is, is it's a bijective map of the unit sphere in four-dimensional complex space because the factors alpha and beta are complex numbers, two dimension, right? And if you're two times two dimension, you are in fact in a four-dimensional space. So the state is a point on the, three, on the unit sphere in four-dimensional space. But because you can find two angles, you have a map of this S3 to the unit sphere in the regular space that we know, the three-dimensional space that we know. And this sphere is called the Bloch sphere. Right? The Bloch sphere is also a physicist. Um, based on the coordinates that we have is we can depict such a state by two angles, by the angle rho, which you typically take from going counterclockwise from the x-axis and then you go from the z-axis this way, you have a unique position of this thing in the, on, on this block sphere. The block sphere will become important. So what you see here is particular angles, of course, correspond to important states. So the state 0 is here the north pole, and the state um, 1 is the south pole. And there are other states, i and minus i, we don't care, but plus and minus are other states that are on the x-axis. <coughs> but we will come back to that. This is how you map this kind of states to the block sphere. And we will use the block sphere to manipulate individual qubits on a quantum machine. This is something uh, that Stephanie showed me. This is a very nice uh, pictorial representation. This is a typical bit. It can be in state 0 or it can be in state 1. And the qubit, it can be exactly in 0 and exactly in 1. But the qubit on the block sphere is covers the overall space, right? Zero is the north pole, and the south pole is, is one. And the more you deviate from the south pole, any point on this sphere is a valid state of a qubit, right? And here you now you approach more the zero. This is something completely uh, uh, different. While a bit can only take two possible values, um, a qubit can have an uncountable infinite possible values. Much more power, right? 
So, a quantum computer, as we will see in a couple of minutes, can compute stuff, <coughs> right? And after computation, right, you manipulate it, the like quantum bit on the blocks where you rotate it and so on, and then you want to measure what the final result will basically be. Then you need to measure it. It's like open the box in which Schrodinger's sketch is in. You want to measure what is now the actual state that I did receive. So measuring this classical bit can be read, right? And you can read the exact state, value zero and one of the bit. But you can't do that for a qubit because the state is the superposition. It's typically neither zero nor one, but a, but a mixture out of it. And if you read a qubit, you destroy the superposition. If you open the box of Schrodinger's cat, the cat is either dead or alive. So you destroy the zombie state. And here you do the very same. If you measure a qubit, you destroy this mixture out of zeros and ones. Right? So measuring means you destroy it. And the corollary is you, can don't, you can't read a qubit, or you can read it only once. Right? Once you read it, it's zero or one, but the superposition has been destroyed which has severe impact on uh, most on databases, right? So, and if you have a status, alpha zero plus beta one, if you read it, then with probability uh, modulus alpha square, you get a zero with probability beta square, right? So measurement destroys this, and measurement is some sort of a random experiment, right? Because if you read, you get with a certain probability <coughs> zero, with another probability, one. So it's a random experiment. And this, if you use a quantum computer, you do the same calculation many, many times, right? To get the statistical the deviation out of it, the, yeah, and then you probably give out the most probable value, as we will see. I don't understand. You say to measure it many times, but beforehand you say to measure it once, measure then you run the once, algorithm again. You destroy it. You said it is yeah, destroyed. but then you run the algorithm again. You prepare the state again, run you the algorithm again. again. You do it iteratively. Okay. You do it iteratively. Okay. And so computation step is we have here a qubit. A qubit is a vector of length one. And if you manipulate it, it stays a vector of length one. It means a manipulation, a computation step is a linear map that preserves the length. And length preserving maps are called unitary maps in mathematics, right? In linear algebra. It means you manipulate it, you get another state here, and the computation step now is very important is represented by unitary maps because unitary maps have very, very nice mathematical properties that you use when you design algorithms where you prove properties of the algorithms. Here's how quant what a quantum algorithm looks like. So what you do in an ideal quantum algorithm, you prepare the state of your quantum computer, you do a unitary transformation. I say a unit, typically you run many, many different transformations, but the product of unitary maps is again a unitary map, so you can uh, take a look at, the, at an algorithm as a single unitary map. But in fact, as we will see, it's a set of unitary maps, a sequence of unitary maps. Then you do the measurement, right? Uh, forget that uh, the that, uh, server media. In the meantime, if you deal with today's quantum computer, what you often do is you do some pre-processing on a classical device, then you do the process on a quantum computer, and even after measurement, you do some post-processing. I have one or two examples uh, where this happens. So typically, quantum computer is not a standalone computer, but you always need it in combination with a classical computer. Many people say that even in far future, we won't have our quantum computer on the desktop or something. You always have a hybrid environment. So call it a quantum processor. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Because it processes under the u with usage of quantum technology. Okay. Absolutely correct. It's a processor, and not a com complete computer. Yeah, but you can do some computation, as you will see, even without a classical. So some algorithms don't need a classical computer. Yeah. Good. The example, the most famous example, is, is very, the, your very first quantum algorithm is coin flipping. Coin flipping means. Uh, we want to have an algorithm that results in zero with exact prob probability one half and result one with exact probability one half, right? So this is the algorithm. You don't need to understand it yet. What you do is you prepare your qubit in the state one. Then you apply a transform that is called the Hadamard transform. The Hadamard transform does the following. It takes the state zero and maps it to, the, uh, to this state and one is meant to this state, and what it is used, it is 
total superposition, perfect superposition out of 1 and 0 because this is 50% 0, 50% 1, so Hanama is used to create superposition out of states, right? perfect superposition. And then you measure. If you measure now with 50%, you will measure this thing, it's 1, with 50% you measure 0, that means uh, so this is the, what the Hadamard uh, map is doing. <coughs> now if you measure, you get with modulus square, that means one divided by square root zero, square is one and a half, measure zero and one. That means it's a perfect random number, which is something that you cannot achieve on a classical computer. Right? So a quantum computer can produce real uh, random numbers. But there is an impossible algorithm. There's an algorithm that doesn't work. For example, it's called the no cloning theorem. It says there can be no algorithm which can copy an arbitrary state of a system. Right? That means if you find an algorithm, you can find an algorithm that copies one qubit and then it can only copy uh, rectangular states, but you can't find an algorithm that can copy any kind of qubit, which is the case of death to quantum databases. Yeah, because you can't read it, we read only once. You can't copy it to build an index. Terrible. Here is the mathematics behind it. As I said before, don't worry, you will find in the handout, and I'm sure you will be motivated instead of going to the beach, read the slides and do it. So, now what is a quantum register? So, a register is a series, quantum register is a series of n of, of, a, of a bunch of quantum bits. While a classical register, as we know, is a series of regular bits, so a quantum register with n qubits is in the superposition of these two n states. And this is an individual qubit, you have n out of it, each qubit can be in state 0 or 1, and you, you, uh, 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 these, these individual states are the individual states. Now you have superposition, you build the linear combination again based on this complex numbers, so you result in superposition of these two. Of n states. While a classical group register with n qubits has only one value at a time. Right? Just because it's a binary representation of the number that you basically get. So a quantum register with n bits has two to the power of n values at the same time. At the same time. And that's a huge number. For example, if you have a 50 qubit computer, which is what you can have today by some of the vendors, right? Two to the power of 50 is uh, to 10 to the power of 15, and you are in the area of beta bytes. Very huge number. These are manipulated in a single step. <coughs> Lots of compute power is behind it. And 50 uh, qubits is only the beginning. People speak about there is one vendor like D-Wave, they have 4,000, they announce 8,000 qubits end of this year. So you have a huge number of data that you can manipulate. But, but when, yeah. I, when I read the the n qubits, I get one, one. back. Yeah. So you have a lot of power, uh, but then you open the box, because there's a single bit. Yeah. yeah, okay. But the, the power is really during the manipulation. Yeah. Right? And this is called, we will see today, quantum parallelism, because it manipulates this two to the power of n data at the same time. Right? Quantum parallelism. Here you see a chip, it's only a very poor chip, it has five qubits. Right? These are the qubits. What you hear see is some stuff where you can have microwaves that influence the qubits that are sold here. This is an IBM supercomputer, a superconducting thing. Here's the drawing, and you abstract it into some sort of a, of a graph, and the lines here show which qubits are connected and can be manipulated uh, uh, as, as a pair. This will become important, this kind of figure. Right? So qubits, and the edges show which of the qubits can be manipulated at the same time. So formally, the quantum register, this is a qubit, and the quantum register is a product out of qubit, and this is, has a special name, it's called the tensor product. Yeah, a tensor product. It's a product you can compute, <coughs> a tensor product, as we know from the law of distributivity. So you have one quantum bit, you have the second quantum bit, and now if you take the register, you just take this here, then you multiply it with a regular multiplication. Right? That means you compute it, you trust me, this is law of distributivity, you compute it, you get this out of it, then you simplify it, right? You omit the beta i gamma j gives beta i gives alpha i j, and you can even simplify this kind of notation by omitting here the vertical bar and this bracket here. This is how you write the status of a 
quantum so, bit. And these real numbers are complex numbers? Complex numbers. numbers. Complex numbers. Complex numbers. numbers. Yeah. Everything is complex numbers. So this is, uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> so uh, that means if, if we say H2, Hilbert space of dimension 2, it's a complex vector space that is spanned by the vector 0 and the vector 1. Right? And if you have a quantum register with n qubits, right, then a vector of length 1 in this uh, space is then called the status of the quantum register. And in fact, it's a very high dimensional complex vector space. It's a complex number. Uh, the domain of complex numbers to the power of 2 to the power of n. It's a highly dimensional complex vector space. Right? And it's, instead, there's a Hilbert space, <coughs> very interesting, right? You have a scalar product, it's complete, that means every Cauchy sequence is converging, you can do a lot of stuff. And now, if you have so a quantum register, is a vector in this tensor product of qubits, and now we need to do something very interesting called separability. So such a state is separable if the quantum register state can be written as a product of the states of the qubits. So what we see is, so this is an interesting thing. Although phi phi is an element of this tensor product of the vector space, as we will see is that only few states are separable, can be written as individual vectors in the individual vector space. This is called separable, right? And if you are not separable, we call it entangled. Yeah, entangled. So here's a state that is separable, right? So if you measure the first qubit, right, you, the measurement results in zero, and then the, re the resulting state is you measure here zero, here zero, you measure the, the, the second qubit will be still in the superposition of 0 and 1, yeah, because we measure 0. Absolutely fantastic. That means measuring the first qubit doesn't uh, uh, destroy or interfere with the second qubit. That is separable can be proven as following. This state is uh, this state tensor point with this state. Now we have another state. Right? This state is something very, very weird. Right? This looks innocent. The only thing that I do is I exchange this zero by this <coughs> one. And now if I measure the first quantum bit, for example, I measure zero, then this part is basically gone because here the state of the first qubit is one. That means if I measure, I get only this part, and then I know that the second qubit will be in the state of zero. If I measure a one, this part is gone. That means the second qubit is also in the state one. It means if I measure, if I have two qubits that are entangled, and if I measure one qubit, I know in, uh, immediately the state of, of the second qubit. And the real crazy thing is, this happens even if the two qubits are far apart, light years apart. Right? That means if I measure, if I have two, I, I have two entangled particles, I bring them apart, one is on Mars, one is on the Earth. As soon as I measure, measure the status of the qubit on Earth, I know immediately what the status on Mars is. And this is something that is that was absolutely confusing to Albert Einstein. And he said this proves that quantum physics is wrong because if this particle is on Mars and the other is, is on Earth, right, no communication is faster than the speed of light. It can't happen that both particles that if, if I measure one, I, I instantaneously what the other state of the particle is. This is why it's called Einstein for those the Rosen paradox. Right? In the meantime, it has been proven, even by experiments, that this will happen. Right? And how it is uh, compatible with relativity is something that I refer to Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, now what is entanglement? This is another chart that I like that uh, Stefanie showed once. Here are four qubits, a quantum register with four qubits. And if I manipulate one qubit, fantastic, I manipulate one qubit and the others are unaffected. But if they are entangled by some magical mechanism that they entangle them, if they're close together, if I fit around with the first qubit, what happens is that the other qubits are also manipulated. That means if you have an entangled state, Right? Manipulation of one qubit results in manipulation of the other qubits at the same time. 
This is the power of entanglement. And we will see that this is really powerful. Right? Entanglement. And entanglement <coughs> is absolutely unique for quantum computing. There is nothing uh, 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 corresponding or analogous in classical computing. And what you can prove is every computation that does not involve entanglement can be performed with the same efficiency of a classical computer. Right? That means if you get some increase in efficiency, or if you change the complexity class, you must exploit entanglement. And you can even prove further, every quantum algorithm that shows exponential speed up must use uh, entanglement. Right? So exponential speed up must use entanglement. But if you want to be efficient, you may use uh, uh, entanglement. So how do you manipulate now this quantum, this qubits and quantum registers? So what you see is, if this, remember this is the vector space of a single qubit. If you have a linear, a unitary map from one qubit to another, it's both a one qubit operator or a gate, right? And here are very three famous gates, right? We call the so-called Pauli matrices, right? And there are other matrices that are important, the Hanuman matrices, the phase matrix, and the P divided by H matrix. Don't be confused that here is pi divided by four. Yeah? These are very important matrices. Why are they important? I'll try to explain it in the next five minutes. Gates are represent here, the uh, uh, lines are, are quantum bits, and the squares uh, <coughs> are the operators, right? the gates on the quantum bits. And after me, Michael Hahn will give you a hands-on IBM quantum computing. The quantum computer, they have a graphical tool how you do compose algorithms. Right? This is the graphical paradigm. It's a graphical language how to build uh, quantum algorithms. Remember again, we have this uh, block sphere. And blocks, uh, what we have here is, if you have the uh, Pauli X matrix, the Pauli X matrix, I omitted mathematical formula to take the exponential function of a matrix is again another matrix just forget it this is then this rx so basically the Pauli x matrix is a rotation around the x-axis around a certain vector uh, and Pauli y matrix is a rotation around the y-axis and Pauli z what a surprise is a rotation around the z-axis right? and this is what many implementations do right if they manipulate quantum bits they try to rotate the states of the, of, the, of the implementation around this kind of angles. Remember the blocks with the north pole is zero, the south pole is one, and so on. What we have here is if you rotate zero with the x, uh, probably x matrix, you get the south pole. Right? If you rotate, for example, plus by uh, 180 degree, you get minus, forget the plus amount, and so on. But here's something more. But if you rotate, if you take the Hanuman matrix and take the south pole, what you, you map, uh, the north pole, you map it first to the south pole, uh, uh, you map it first to the south pole, and then you map it to here, or equivalently, if you go with uh, pi uh, and a pi half, pi divided by half this way. So this is how you can uh, you get a little bit of geometric impression what this uh, matrix is basically doing with the individual quantum bits. What we are looking for, if I want to build a quantum computer, I want to build operators, as few as possible basic operators that allow me to manipulate, to perform any kind of manipulation of a quantum bit. We call such a set of operators uh, a universal set of operators. Right? So I'm looking for the minimal set of operators that allow me to compose each and every other operator. This is a universal set of operators. So what you can prove is that any unitary matrix is in fact a multiplication of three rotation matrices. Right? This is elementary or linear algebra. There's really no magic behind it. Right? Or these are rotations around x and y axis. Well, this is, there's nothing, no physics behind it. That means every qubit operator is a composition of rotations on the block sphere. And you have these three fundamental rotations that you basically have. So manipulation, manipulating a quantum bit is simple. What you as a vendor of a quantum computer has to do is you have to implement rotations on the block sphere. Right, so, and because the rotations operator correspond to the Pauli matrices, so the set of Pauli operators are universal for one qubit operators. 
Then the question is, can I find a universal set of operators for a quantum register of many qubits? Right? So I have a quantum register with a tensor product of many qubits, and the, and the unitary method is then called an n qubit operator, and we are looking for a universal set of n qubit operators. The first interesting result is what you can do is you can manipulate two neighbor qubits. So if you have a matrix, two by two, right, this is called a two-level operator. A two-level operator is manipulating two uh, neighbor qubits. Right? And the other qubits remain stable. Uh, they are not modified at all. This is the pictorial representation. Two qubits come in. Here the miracle occurs, two qubits, the same two qubits goes out. This is another example how we will draw the algorithms. So what you can then prove is that the set of all two-level operators on quantum registers is universal. It means what, what, what you can prove is you can manipulate a whole quantum register by iteratively manipulating two neighbor qubits. Right? But there is an infinite number of two-level operators. It was an arbitrary two-by-two two matrix. And the vendor does not want to implement an arbitrary number of operators down in the hardware. Uh, that means this is bad. But if you have a quantum chip, right, uh, you need connections between the two qubits to apply a two-level operator. Right? That means these two qubits can be manipulated by, uh, by a, a two-level operator. These two bits can't. Right? And this is what we will see in course of the presentation uh, the reason why if, uh, if a theoretician writes an algorithm down, right, it gets blown up because it makes you, the theoretical algorithm makes use of, of, uh, of two-level operators, but down at the hardware there's a compiler. The compiler in this state needs to swap these two qubits, entangle them for example, and swap them back. It means if you have an, a very small algorithm, the compiler blows the algorithm up, makes it much, much larger. Right, and this will give the problems we have today. <coughs> One of the most important, or the most important um, uh, two-level operator is the control, not the <coughs> control, not just the following. Um, uh, here, here's the text. This is the uh, binary addition modulo 2. Right? That means you add 2, take it modulo 2. That means if x is 1, you change the state of y. If x is 0, the state of y is uh, remains unchanged. Right? This is the controlled knot. I control the negation of the y while the first state is. This is why y is called the target bit and x is called the control bit. Right? x, the status of, of, of uh, x controls what happens with y, is it negated or not. It's a unitary operation, that means it can be it's a manipulated quantum bit. And this is the gate representation. Here's the dot that shows what the control bit is, and here's the target bit, and this plus is the plus here. This is a canonic representation of the, of the gate. Remember this state? This state was a separable state, and if I apply the control not operator, what it means is it C not, uh, you apply C not here, C not means you invert this thing if, if this is 1, but this is 0, so it remains the same. This is 1, uh, that means 0 will be negated, it will be 1, and this is the Einstein-Podolsky pair, right? This entangled pair. It means what we see here, C not is important because C not can take a separable, a separate state and entangle it. Right? So, and because C0 is unitary, that means inversible, if you apply C0 again, you get the original status. That means C0 can be used to unentangled states. This is why C0 is absolutely important. C0 creates entangled states, and you can create, uh, use C0 to unentangled state, because at the end you may want to in unentangle stuff. And in the hardware that's again here, these two cannot, this can be immediately entangled, these two can't. I first need to swap them. I right? need to add additional operators uh, uh, in order to entangle them. And entanglement was important. That means the connectivity of a quantum chip is very important. Connectivity is the degree of how uh, are the individual qubits connected. 
cannot directly ma uh, man uh, manipulate them. But is there a physical limit on that? The, uh, there's a technical limit. The technical there's no physical limit. Yeah. Yeah. The more they are connected, the more noisy yeah, they will okay. get. Right? And the edges probably can't overlap. Uh, what they, they do three, three dimensional stuff oh, oh, the time, right? They have yeah. fires then from here to here, and so on. The IBM chip in the meantime is a three dimensional uh, chip. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, Connectivity is important. So, and now you can prove is that the set of one qubit operators, the Pauli matrices, and C naught is universal for quantum registers. Not only that means you can, any operation on a quantum computer can be performed by the Pauli matrices or by the two level C0 operator. Right? And this is something what people would like to implement. Right? But the complexity, if n is the number of qubits, the number of one chair or Pauli matrices in C0 is of the order of n squared times 4 to the power of n. This is much too complicated. Right? It's absolutely not efficient to implement such an operation. I don't know. So, is that that, is that not so that you have all There comes another very important theorem called solo Peter theory. It shows that the Hadamard matrix, phase matrix T and C0 is universal in the sense that by using these operators, you can approximate any other operator with arbitrary precision. So, what does means you take the original operator, u, and it gives you a random distribution of the results. And approximation here means if I implement u as a series of HSTC not operators, <coughs> right, I come very close to the random distribution of the original operator. And because quantum computing is all about randomness, probability, right, we don't care. Right? Because if the statistical distribution are very close to each other, you can't distinguish them. And this is what the current hardware implementers do. Right? They implement these kind of matrices and approximate, and they know, according to this theorem, that any <coughs> computation is good enough. If I do this, and this is what people So, stop. So why can't you compare it complexity wise with the previous result? You say, uh, it is there. It's a logarithm, it's something. Oh, okay. So, it's, it's absolutely good. Oh, okay. I admit it many of the forms. Too bad. Uh, okay. <coughs> I only have one hour. Now we need to have, when we try to approach existing quantum computers, we need to introduce something that's called the depth of an algorithm. Here we have an algorithm, right? These are the qubits, these are the gates. As we saw before, we can, we can, uh, we can use only uh, one qubit operators and two qubit operators. And what they do is they arrange, you can arrange the gates in so-called levels, so the dashed lines are basically levels. And the level is defined by, I can't move a gate one level closer to the left side. Right? Because then they have, I, I basically can't move it here, because, uh, so these are then the levels. So I have a complex algorithm, then I rearrange the gates, and the gates that are at the same level can be performed in parallel on a quantum, quantum computer. And the set of layers that I need in order to perform the, the minimum number of, of levels, the, the layers that I have in order to perform the algorithm, this is called the depth of an algorithm. And today's machines are limited in depth of the algorithm. And the breadth is the number of qubits. The number of qubits. So here's an example. This can obviously move over to here. This can obviously move over to here. This can move over to here. Then this layer is free. I can move it there. So the result is this one, that means what a compiler does is it takes the operators, rearranges them to reduce the number of layers that I basically have. So this has depth 2, even this algorithm at the end has depth 2 and breadth 7, it manipulates 7 and 20 bits. This thing here is now a real algorithm, right? It can be rewritten, I can move this here, I can move this further, this here. It has also the uh, depth 3 and breadth 3 because it does not manipulate this qubit and this qubit, although I would have 5 available, only 3 of them are manipulated. Right? And today's machines are measured by the depth and the breadth of an algorithm. If you take a look at an algorithm, you must determine the depth and breadth to find out can it run on a D-Wave machine, can it run on an IBM machine, this is what you do first. Noise. 
what, what, what we said before, um, any uh, operator can be rewritten as rotations, on, on, a, on a qubit can be rewritten as rotations, but these rotations are typically by irrational numbers. That means they cannot be done precisely. Right? Because the irrational number is infinite. That means each and every operation has an inherent noise. Right? It's inherently imperfect. That means the quantum operators are typically noisy, and even the qubits are interacting with the environment. That means they decay over time. That means qubits are also unstable, called decoherent. Right? So the decoherence time, after a couple of times, certain time of a millisecond, right, the qubit can't be used anymore. It's too <coughs> noisy. Right? And the same is true with each individual operator. You can now do Peter Force Funds. Um, uh, Error propagation. Absolutely. Error propagation. You compute a little bit error propagation and you find a, 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 the error is increasing linearly and so on. Right? So, which has the consequence that the quantum algorithm cannot be performed for an arbitrary long time because the qubits are decaying and they cannot contain too many steps because each individual operator is a little bit worse. So that means you have a noisy algorithm. Here is at this point in time, after executed a certain gate several times, it produces an error, or here's a quantum bit that produces an, an error. And there's a very, very rough estimation about the algorithms you can perform on a computer. If epsilon is the error rate, right, how frequent an error happens, how often a, a qubit does decay, then the width of the algorithm, the number of quantum bits manipulated, and the depth, the number of parallel layers that you basically have, must be significantly less than 1 divided by epsilon. Right? But we see error correction in a few minutes. So, if you take this uh, equation and you have an algorithm that has only a few qubits, so w is small, then d can get large. This is called a deep quantum algorithm. But because you only have very few qubits, you can classically simulate such an algorithm. So if an algorithm only requires a few qubits, you can use it on a classical computer. But classically, it really means one of the largest supercomputer at all. Right? 2 to the power of n is what we have manipulated at the same step. So, what I saw recently is, in the meantime, two or three weeks ago, that Google and NASA and the university some of something, they simulated 49 qubits on a Unix cluster, high end machine with 800 machines. It took them three weeks to run a quantum algorithm. The same algorithm has been run on a Google machine in a couple of milliseconds. The cluster, of course, uh, used 15 megawatt of power, the quantum computer a few watts. But this is something that will become important at a later point in time. If you, say, if, if you tell somebody these kinds of numbers, then if you are a CIO of a huge company, you say, I immediately buy a quantum computer because I can reduce the cost of my compute center by reducing the power. Power costs. And so, and what, what we would call these kind of machines, so if you have a shallow quantum algorithm, that means low depth but huge width, right, you have many qubits, this is then a potential for quantum advantage because you can't compute this in a, in a, a traditional environment. And these kind of machines are called NISC machines. In, in, in analogy to RISC and KISC machines, we know classically, it's called noisy intermediate scale quantum computer. So, is epsilon uh, a fixed number or is no, it? No, it's uh, based on the implementation. Okay. Right. So the, uh, for example, implementation meaning hardware. It's hardware. Yeah, the hardware implementation. Absolutely. And okay. Michael will really show it that the, the, the IBM machine. They basically show you what the current epsilon is basically. Epsilon consists out of several numbers, but they show what the error rate is. So improving or getting better on the absolutely will allow you to be more powerful. Absolutely. Okay. And it scales, the IBM guys, they show that they are uh, already on, on Moore's law. Every year they double or quadruple the number of quantum uh, uh, of qubits, the connectivity of the chip, and so on. So it will get better and better and better. I skip over, uh, I only mention it, right? that the, and I showed it last year. And so some of you have been here last year, there was an exponential speed up uh, the, the, 
the Deutsche Lossa algorithm shows an exponential speed up compared to a classical problem. But this was proving the first time the power of such a quantum computer. And at the heart of the algorithm is this kind of thing. You already saw the Hadama operator that produces perfect superposition. And now if you have if you apply this UF, it's basically the control F, you apply F to the to the remaining register. That means in a single, in two steps, what you produce out of a quantum computer is you can compute the value table of a function. Right? You have a function f, and in two steps of a quantum computer, you can produce the value table of a function. Extremely powerful. But if you want to read it, you can only read a single tuple. Right? But internally, during the computation, it's extremely powerful. But when you read it out, you read only one. But this is, uh, however, again called quantum parallelism, right? because we get all this computation done in two steps. Search. I mentioned it last time too. Uh, unstructured search, for example, is you want to find out uh, to whom belongs a certain phone number. Yeah, you only know the phone number, and because you met the lady last night and you want to give her a call, who is the lady? So you go to a telephone book and compare all the phone numbers. Yes? In New York, it will take you weeks, right? Uh, uh, so even other than the phone book doesn't help. And classical search is of the of the complexity uh, order of n. And last time I showed you an algorithm, the Gromer algorithm, that is of complexity square root of n. That means you have a quadratic speed up in search. And what is done is in many NP problems, many means. If you find the special kind of functions called an oracle functions, I'm not diving deeper in, in, into this now, then you can solve, then you can speed up the solution of an NP problem by just missing all possible solutions, building a database out of the possible solutions uh, uh, out of it, apply this global algorithm, and then you can speed up to the uh, kinetic speed up in finding a solution to an NP problem. But the database is in the qubit. Absolutely, in the it's encoded. The power of n possible states. This database in quotation marks. Absolutely, yeah. it's yeah. a collection of yeah. data. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And when do you get speed ups? Well, there's a complexity class that's called bounded error quantum polynomial time, BQP algorithm. Right? And an algorithm is bounded error quantum polynomial time if it can be solved with error probability less than or equal one half minus epsilon. And the minus epsilon is important, right? So same epsilon as before? No, no, different epsilon. Sorry, absolutely different epsilon. And who chooses the epsilon? Uh, the algorithm designer. The, the, ah. You design an algorithm, and then you prove that your algorithm has this property. And then you say epsilon is blah. Typically, you want to achieve one fourth or one third. This is what okay. people are striving for. The B to P is for quantum computing, what P is for classical computing. Yeah? Because if you have a B to P algorithm, what you can do is you modify it a little bit, you remove <coughs> the algorithm A n times, and the result with the highest frequency will be output as the result of the algorithm. You have a B to P algorithm, you run it n times, right? And then you measure the frequency, a certain result occurs, and then the most frequent result uh, is then shown as the result. And the user chooses the end. Capital Absolutely. End. This is, you will see that, you use a quantum computer, you specify how many shots, it's called a shot. Typically, for free, you get 1,000. On, in production, you do 1 million, million because it's so fast. Right? You run 1 million times, then you get the distribution. Often, you get nearly a Dirac function. That means this is the value, and then you have you know this is the result. And capital N is dependent on? You specified. Yeah, but I ran There's no clue. Oh. No, open research. Oh, OK. Right? But it we will see what we, we have some estimations for it. It depends on what we We know, no. That's bad. No, it, in, no. Simple, in simple cases, we know, we know, we know what, what, what N is. So there's a, there's a theorem. The probability to output the correct result increases exponentially with the number of N repetitions. That means the higher n is, right? Uh, and here you have, a, you have a formula. The number, the probability that you spit out the wrong result is less than minus blah blah blah. So this is what you sort of share about. So there's some rough estimation how often you must run an algorithm if you want to have the right result. But this is a good result because this is, yeah, this is, this is because good. with a few 
repetition yes, terms. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, where am I? Here am I. Yeah. You can, you can so, make sure that you get right. success amplification. You can amplify it. Right. You saw it already. If omega is the maximum probability, you accept the wrong result. Right. You can prove this simple formula. If you choose n greater than blah blah blah, mm -hmm. then your correct result comes out with probability one minus omega. As an example, if you have a DQP algorithm where epsilon is one fourth. Uh, and omega, so with one promile, so you won't have with one promile, you accept with one promile only a wrong result, but then if you, if you execute the algorithm 56 times, then you have the probability 99.99 the correct result. Right? Yeah, this is easy. Now, okay, correct keys. <coughs> okay. We all know, don't be shocked, every natural number has a, can be factored in prime numbers. Pi is the prime number, uh, I, I, Ij is the power, so every natural number can be factored as prime numbers. We don't know that. Right? And then, if you dig deep into number theory, in order to find prime numbers, the factorization of a prime number, you need this function. f of x is equals a to the power of x modulo n. Right? This is something very deep, deep, deep in number theory. And these functions are periodic. Right? If you have here an example, 2 to the power x modulo 5, right? if x is 0, 2 to the power 0 is 1, modulo 5 is 1. 2 to the power of 1 is 2, modulo 5 is 2, blah, 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 blah. You compute it, and then you see it has the period 4. Right? These number theoretic functions are periodic. And what you will now do is, there is Shaw's algorithm. Shaw's algorithm, basically, this is the very simple algorithm. And the magic in the overall algorithm is in this step. So first of all, you find, if you run this algorithm k times, right, you find with the probability uh, greater than 1 minus 1, one uh, divided by 2 to the power of k, um, the factorial uh, factorization, and the overall runtime is uh, log 4, to, uh, so polylogarithmic. And the secret is here, right, in period finding. The rest is done on classical computers. The only thing the quantum computer is used for is for finding the period. How can this be done? We all know if you have periodic functions, like this rectangle function here, right? You have the Fourier series, Fourier approximation of it. That means what you have is this sign function, this sign function, and so on. And what you can now do is you can project it. Uh, what we are all used to, we have, we see the functions here developing in time. If you want to see the uh, Fourier series, you project it onto the frequency. And what you get here is, so this, this function really can be characterized by the frequencies and the amplitude of the sequence. This, is, this representation is exactly this representation. And this is called the spectrum of the function. Okay? Very concrete. So in determining the spectrum is called Fourier transformation. And Fourier transformation jump over it is very fast because what you typically have is discrete Fourier transformation. You don't care about, typically you don't have the closed form expression of the function, but you only have sample values at some sampling points, and then the Fourier coefficients don't try to dig deeper into this stuff. Right? This formula, these things are the complex nth root of unity, complex Einheitswurzel, blah, blah, blah. And what that basically means that Fourier transformation is matrix multiplication. Matrix multiplication can be done perfectly on a quantum computer. Right? And what this Shaw algorithm does is it basically, here you initialize a quantum register, you apply some Hadamard transformation to achieve superposition, you apply an oracle to compute the overall uh, value table of this periodic uh, function, and then you apply quantum Fourier transformation to determine the period then you have, uh, uh, no, not, not quite, you, to determine a certain value. And what you do then is, you develop this value. I only want to say, tell you how crazy this is, how, how, what a genius this guy was. Right? Then you use continuous fraction, you develop the value that you measure from the quantum computer. Right? This is the continuous fraction. And then the prefixes, one of the few first prefixes contains the period of the function. And then you dive back again in this algorithm to determine the, um, uh, the prime number. Well, this man must be crazy. Absolutely fantastic algorithm. 
Hier ist das Speedup. This is Schwarz algorithm, this is the best classical algorithm. Right? What you see is that you can correct your keys very, very fast. But oh I don't know that. If you if the, the number that you want to crack has m bits in binary representation, you need two m qubits. That means as of today, if you have a computer with 50 uh, qubits, you can only crack uh, 2048 something, right? But the status of technology is enhancing, and people are saying that in five years, seven years, we can crack each and every key on this planet, <coughs> which makes many people extremely nervous. And for example, China is in the meantime investing in the system to build a secure system, even if we have quantum computers and crack. It could crack each and every key. And what we can do is, I rush over it, I take fun, the fun you, there's a new kind of encryption technology, not new kind, an old kind of encryption that is revitalized in the, uh, because quantum computers do exist. This is called the one time hack. So if you have a message that consists out of uh, n bits, the clear text, what you do is you generate a key of the same length which are random bits. Random bits can be generated extremely good on a quantum computer, as we saw before. Right? Um, the same size. Then you can encrypt your message M by taking the um, uh, module 2 uh, ad ad addition here. Then C1 to CM is the encrypted message, the crypto text. <coughs> and if you decrypt it, so you receive the Cs, Right, and you pad it, one time pad again, by the key that you share with the sender, then you get the clear message out again. Right? Because k plus k is uh, zero. Right? So this is one time pad. So the mechanics, uh, and this is absolutely secure under, 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 so I give up, under condition that you only use the key once and so on. Right? You can prove this is a very secure uh, uh, thing. So what we now do is, in quantum, uh, okay, because you can generate uh, quantum bits, uh, random numbers, so you generate a series of random bits, you encode the bits as quantum numbers, you don't need to understand, understand the details, right? the recipient receives the quantum bits that you sent to, uh, to him or her, uh, then you exchange some of the qubits that were exchanged to check whether it got uh, attacked. Right? And what you can say is you can detect with very high probability, extremely high probability, whether you have been attacked or not. Right? And the secret here is you encode it as quantum bits. And attacking a quantum bit means to take it, copy it, but you can't copy it, analyze it, and send it back. Because you can't copy it, you destroy the status and you send some other random qubit to the recipient. And uh, if the key is long, long enough, you can detect easily um, uh, attacks. Because right. it's not the, the original string anymore. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's it, yeah. uh, And this is, so to speak, a new infrastructure that people are building. For example, in China, they start building already the infrastructure to have the symmetric uh, key uh, infrastructure so that they can ensure security, when they do banking and so on. But in Germany, if I talk about that, or in Europe, people are not aware at all. They are sleeping, they don't know that in very few years, banking is gone, Amazon is, as I mean, online shopping is gone, everything is gone, right? Based on current uh, security infrastructure that we basically have. So it is secure. Error correction. If you want to do error correction, uh, error correction depends on copying bits. You can't do that because uh, copying bits cannot be done in the quantum area. The errors we have in classical computing are discrete. In quantum computing, these are continuous errors because they are only modified a little bit and so on. Right? If you want to read something, it is destructive. You need to have completely new kinds of mechanism to do error correction. It's a very flourishing, very fantastic field that we currently have. And what they do is, each bit is encoded as, in this case, in nine bits. So if you, if you have a single bit and you want to error correct it, you must encode it in this way in nine bits. You can do better, right? but this is the most easiest one. Right? So you need to encode it this way. <coughs> the result is, so 
in, if you have n noisy bits, right? Um, you need so, so you need nine in this case nine noisy physical bits to realize one stable logic to qubit. That means if IBM says I have 50 qubits, you need to divide it by 10, and then you have five bits that are really useful if you want to have this kind of stable bits. Here you have the single bit, so this is also speaking the single bit. No, this is the logical bit that you have, and it is realized as a block of physical bits. But even worse, the consequence is that if you have a gate, the gate now operates on the logical bit, which is in fact a bunch of physical bits. That means each gate must be realized as a subroutine, as another algorithm. That means each innocent gate that the theoretician draws on this canvas right, is expanded into a, uh, a whole subroutine. And periodically, you must do error correction to find out where an error happened which contributes again to the depth of the algorithm, right? That basically, mean, uh, so that, uh, that basically means what we need is, today we have machines that are decoherent, that means the qubits, they are unstable, right? The gates, the gate operations are a little bit imprecise. I didn't mention that even reading, measuring the status of the bit introduces some errors. The bit connectivity is limited. The connections between the current multiple is connected. This is the current state of affair. Right? A lot of technical problems with quantum computers, but there are a lot of, lot of, lot of technical problems uh, to be solved. I wouldn't call that problems, challenges. Challenges, absolutely, <laughs> challenges. Right? And this, as I introduced before, this is the state <laughs> of NISC. So NISC computing is the attempt to do meaningful quantum computing in such a noisy situation. Right? Noisy means 50 to 100 quantum bits, and the limited operations count can be performed, as I introduced before, to show quantum supremacy. Blah, 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 blah. So I go quickly over that. Here's, by the way, the price of a quantum computer. Some people think that the quantum computer is expensive, so in the literature, you see that you can use a quantum computer for two, uh, 200 euros per hour. Now, these are realistic prices. Right? We discussed with some vendors, some are a bit cheaper, some are a bit more expensive. <coughs> but quantum computer is not extremely expensive as you may imagine the first time. Right, so let me set, skip over all of it uh, because most of the stuff has been explained. You see, Japanese, uh, I rush, I need to rush. Um, so the software architecture today is hybrid. As I mentioned before, you need some classical preparation, <coughs> then you do the quantum computing, then you do some post-processing. Right? People call it variational. Let's skip over the last name here. So the are states of variational. Uh, and where applications are currently done is in deep learning, yeah? in, uh, in, in machine learning in general, matrix inversion to build a recommender system, to uh, use a four vector machine. Uh, Wilfred Reimer lets us show that this is already uh, used at Daimler in production. Right? They use a quantum computer with a four vector machine to do classification, to find errors in car production, uh, simulation, and so on. So, there are a bunch of applications that can be done in this noisy environment. And what we have done is we got a project funded by the Ministry of Economy called Planck. It was a surprise. So, Stephanie is on board and Andreas is, is on board. Right? Uh, platform and uh, platform and ecosystem for quantum supported artificial intelligence. And what we want to do is we are currently in the process of building a crawler to get access to the articles that are written by quantum algorithmic guys, right? store them in a quantum uh, in a, in a catalog. Then we have one quantum machine runner on board, um, uh, Jens Isaac from FU Berlin. Right, he is analyzing the algorithms whether they can be implemented uh, uh, based on current NIST machines. And they are then represented in a uniform manner, stored in the quantum algorithm repository. Right? Um, people can implement these algorithms that run on NIST machines to result in quantum programs. Customers or users can basically search for proper algorithms or even programs, can order them, run them on the quantum computer, and this is what we are currently working on. <coughs> so summary, quantum algorithms are very different from classical algorithms, very different skills are needed to solve quantum, uh, problems in quantum computing, you can 
Kanti curricular program up. Might be really here educated. Uh, the current state of the art in software is implementing quantum at an assembler level, a level as Michael will show you in a minute. Uh, hardware of quantum computers is rapidly evolving. In the next few years, deep problems like factorization uh, will be solvable. And NISC and quantum computing skills uh, should be built up by the companies these days. Right? So in China, they're doing it all over the place. and we run around Germany and like missionaries and basically saying learn, 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 learn. And Mike is now showing you <coughs> what you can do, in a, uh, how you would program a quantum computer, right? How does it look like? Michael. So Michael is working uh, at IAS for some years. He worked on uh, the excellent Cluster Simtech in simulation technology and he fell in love with quantum computing. Right? <laughs> he worked also with Skyglass, so he has some practical experiences. <laughs> 